Hi, everyone. Are we getting real close, do you think, to the return of the Son of God to reign for a thousand years here on the earth? Do you feel it almost here? God the Father, we're told in Scripture by Yeshua himself, God is the one who knows the exact day and hour. Not even the angels of heaven knew when Jesus said that anyway. And no doubt we're ten years closer today than we were ten years ago. No doubt about that. Do you feel a sense of growing anxiety, a growing angst all over the world? I certainly do. I hear it from people who correspond with me from around the world, and, and, and there is this sense of angst. I'm also feeling a great sense that there's a very evil spirit flowing profusely in the land right now. You sense it too, don't you? I think it's very possible that Satan has attacked God's throne already and has been cast down. If not, it will happen soon. And when it does happen, he's very, very angry, according to Revelation 12. So I hope you'll get a chance to read that if you don't know what I'm talking about. But in my last sermon, part one, to understanding the times we live in, I even offered that there's a tipping point that we're coming to in this, in this age. What happens in November 2020 in America will be huge for not just America, but for the whole world. The sides are so diametrically opposite on just about every major point that depending on who God puts in power and God allows to be put in power, sometimes I think he decides to put in power the ones we deserve uh, by showing how much we care and prayed about and, and spoke up and did things and showed concern for our country. And I'll show you that very much so, so in this sermon. I'll prove that as we're going along. Are you praying for your country? Not just America, but whatever country you are in when you're watching this. Do you see that we're at a tipping point time of history? Do you recognize that a century from now, two, two centuries from now, this time period we live in right now, this year we live in right now will be seen as a historically pivotal year? I really believe it will be. Of course, we all hope for Christ to return soon. We all hope for the setting up of his millennial reign as described by Daniel 2. And when all the pillars and foundations uh, of all other systems are destroyed. But right now, what we're seeing is that all the pillars and foundations of our country that were originally established, as much as they understood how, on the Bible, originally established on law and order, uh, are being demolished. And uh, we're watching this chaos going, going on in our country. So anyway, but in spite of all of that, I still find that a lot of believers somehow are able to stay very blasé and not all that excited about it and simply say, hey, it's Satan's world. What do I care? This was all uh, prophesied to happen anyway. So what do I care? That's what some people say. And uh, there's not a lot I can do to do anything about it. I can't stop it. God's the one who puts authorities in control. Romans 13 is very clear about that. So the sooner all the world's governments, including ours here in the United States, topple, the better, is what some of you are saying, and you go on to your merry way. Another thing, a question I have, if we really do understand the times and what's going on, does God really just want us to go about our way and do nothing? We'll continue that discussion today. Remember the sons of Issachar, they understood the time, so they went to go see David. So they were part of the group that anointed, or not anointed, but, but made him, declared him to be king. Think about that and what that means maybe for us today. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of Light on the Rock. Welcome to our site. I do still work full time, so uh, I try to do these as much as I can, working with my wife and I, and then also with Scott and uh, Brandy. And hopefully they'll put up a picture so you can see them again. A lovely couple. God brought us all together for this specific purpose, I think, to get this website out. And without Brandy and Scott, Scott and Brandy, I don't see how this website uh, could, could go on or how it would even survive. So I'm very, very appreciative for the countless hours they put into it. Countless hours. Uh, so be sure to check out the audio sermons, not just the video like you're watching now. But they're also, uh, we'll show you this on the screen uh, there's a section called audio sermons on the home page. You can see the most recent audio ones that were right now we're reposting some older ones 
like I just reposted one about the Gentiles, a couple on those. I'll repost one about being uh, a paracletos, a, a comforter. And um, also, if you want to see all the sermons that we've done videos on already, it's amazing how many we have done already, uh, right there at the homepage at the top, it'll say videos. So go there, uh, click it down, you'll see. Then go to the audios, where it says uh, sermon list, and those are the audio sermons. Then I think next to that are, are, are the blogs, and we have hundreds and hundreds of blogs. Blogs are short articles and uh, literally hundreds of topics. I think you'll find them very, very interesting. Um, some recent blogs that I've posted that are new are uh, What the Scriptures Say About Race. I also posted one on uh, the coming cashless society. Do we really want that? There are stores already that are saying we want you to not bring in any, uh, anything but, uh, but cards. We don't want cash. So please take the, kind, the time also to comment and uh, tell us what you think of these sermons and blogs and the help we're offering you for free. We don't, we don't say for $19.95, we'll send you this DVD or if you give a generous offering, we'll do this. No, we don't do that. And, and if you do it right now, we might send you too. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't do that. Anyway, so back to the sermon. We're talking about understanding the times. Last time we talked about the men of Issachar and how they had an under understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do, so they came and helped David become king. Yeshua said, he's, that's Jesus, he said, um, you, you can discern the sky and the, and the weather, but somehow you can't discern the times. And he was uh, correcting them for that. So pray that God open your eyes and mind to understand the times that we live in. In part one, I want to review some key things of part one and move on to part two. The key pillars are being systematically kicked out of our system. God, the first point is God has been systematically kicked out of our lives in school, in government, in the military, in the public arena. God has, for the last 60 to 70 years, been kicked out little by little by little until finally you won't, it'll even take off in God we trust and all the other things we do. And, uh, you know, when people make a vow or oath and they say, so help me God, or things like that, you watch those things also stop. Our country was largely founded by people who believed in the Bible, but in the last 60 word, God's word, 60 years, God's word has been kicked out. And because of turning against God himself, and, uh, and, and because of the Supreme Court decisions, some of them are fine, but some of them have been awful, uh, the protective hedge that God said he would put around our country is, is going to be burned down. Uh, last time, I think we might have turned to Isaiah 5. Let's turn there again. Isaiah 5, verse uh, 7 and 5, verse 7 identifies that the vineyard that he's going to be talking about, or the pleasant plant, uh, the vineyard, is the house of Israel. That's the northern ten. And the men of Judah is also the pleasant plant. So he's talking about the entirety of of all 12 tribes in Isaiah 5 verse 7. We'll have that up. And uh, remember that I believe very, very strongly that uh, the, the so-called lost 10 tribes aren't lost at all. They're lost to themselves. But uh, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, Israel, uh, he called them all together in Genesis 49, the first few verses. And he says, let me tell you what's going to befall you in the last days. So somewhere out there are 12 nations, not just a little tiny country called Israel in the Middle East. That, that, was, the, that was the tribe of Judah. And Levi and uh, uh, Benjamin also were part of that in the original uh, years. But now let's pick up from Isaiah 5.5. 5. And now please let me tell you, God speaking here, what I will do to my vineyard. He's talking about the Israel, meaning, and I really believe this, meaning the United States. Britain, Canada, Australia, Northwestern Europe, as well as the country of Israel. And I'll give, a, I'll give a sermon sometime soon to show you that. But now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard, he says, Isaiah 5.5. 5. I will take away its hedge. What's a hedge? It's what protects you, okay? It uh, protects you from harm. And it shall be burned. It's going to tear it down and burn it. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. This is God speaking. If our hedge of protection is going to be removed, we're going to see some terrible things beginning to happen in our country, much worse than anything we've seen before, much worse. 
Why is God going to do that? If you read the rest of Isaiah 5, you'll see in verse 20 that you guys are real good at calling good evil and evil good. You guys are real good at turning me out of your life. In fact, go back to Isaiah 1. It just comes to me now. Go back to Isaiah 1. Isn't that where God says, look, the, the donkey or the cow or whatever he's talking about in there knows its master, knows how to where its home is, but you don't know me? So God is saying, you have turned me away, and I am going to turn you away as well. But no matter what happens, remember, God can continue to put a hedge around you individually and your family. Pray for that. Really pray for that. Uh or he can also decide that, hedge or not, he's going to let you and I go through trials to his glory or, and also to help us be refined in the fire. But those, will, those trials, I hope, will strengthen us and keep us strong for the purpose that he has for us for all eternity. Satan's goal is to change this world system so that a future one world, new world order under the beast system that's prophesied in the book of Revelation that will be worshiping really Satan, that's what he wants, that that system can be set up and force everyone to go their way, to say their words, to think their thoughts, to do their deeds, or you will be killed. Simple as that. It's all through the book of Revelation, parts of Daniel, Matthew 24. Satan's really the one doing this. He hates God. He hates God's family. He hates you and me. And so we're going to see greater and greater persecution and uh, hindrances to our way of life, the righteous way of life, and uh, be ready for it. Once this foundation is destroyed, the foundation that's built on God, that talks about God, that ha has this Bible at least, once God is kicked out, then it opens the door to every other evil that we can have, that we can even think about. Even the Supreme Court of the land has made some awful decisions. 1973. 1973, uh, Roe versus Wade, Roe v. Wade. And since that time, over 60, 60 million unborn boys and little girls who had beating hearts in many cases already, who were already formed, who were already three, four, five months along. And I talked about this last time are now being ripped out and thrown away. Can we sit back and not say and not do things and not get involved? Not sigh and cry and pray for God's kingdom to come and mention abortion in particular? Now, I know young women especially or whoever has a, an unplanned uh, pregnancy uh, can have some severe anxiety, but I'm praying that we can help people understand that there's so many people who would love to adopt that child. The second thing was in 2013, the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, DOMA, was thrown out as somehow being unconstitutional, even though the Constitution itself nowhere discusses marriage. President Obama celebrated by bathing the White House, the People's House, in the, in, in the colors of the LGBTQ. But in fact, the rainbow is supposed to be the colors that God used for his covenant with mankind, with Noah and his family, that you can read about after the flood. And then in June 2020, just very recently, uh, there can be no discrimination based on sex, and, and they made it very clear that that was not just based on your biological uh, description, that you're male and female, but on your sexual orientation. So there can be no discrimination um, I think religious uh, groups are able to do so, but other than that, I think so. Um, they're now saying that uh, you're, you'll be based on sexual orientation. And see where that's going to lead to us. If you want to sometime read Leviticus 18 and all the things it says, how God warns us, don't go down that road. There are certain things I don't want you to be doing sexually. Not just adultery and fornication, but he goes on to list a whole bunch of things. So go back and read Levit Leviticus 18 and uh, where it says in the King James and New King James to uncover your nakedness. I think that is more an expression of uh, don't have sex with, don't uncover your nakedness with your, with your um, brother or sister or so on. It goes on and gives a long list. 
before long, I suspect we're going to find that this society will allow legally for who for people to have sex with whomever they want, how many they want, whoever we want, even marry how many, however many we want, whatever we want, well, whenever we want, and uh, chaos will ensue uh, from God's you know, prophesied word in Leviticus 18. We also discovered that we're, there's so much more demonism, witchcraft. We talked about how what started out as a protest against a horrible act of brutality and murder in a George Floyd case has now been hijacked to be attacks on the police themselves, on businesses, looting and anarchy and arson, and they're not peaceful protests anymore. So keep that in mind, that this has all been hijacked, and now it's being used as, a, used as an excuse to uh, completely disassemble, disembowel our whole nation as we know it. I also mentioned that 2020 will be the time remembered of how quickly things can change. We learned that this year. I'm going to add now some new points in our uh, ability to understand the times. We keep a, while, a watch on Jerusalem. Keep a watch on Jerusalem. That little spot of ground over there is very, very important to God. Always has been. Keep an, keep an eye out on Germany and, and uh, Europe and watch what's going there. Keep an eye out on China. Uh, China is growing in power. Uh, they're building bases. I don't know if God's going to let them rise to the ascendancy they want or or uh, collapse China. I don't know. The people are fine, but the People's uh, Liberation Army, the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party, uh, no, they're, they're some, something to watch. They want to become the world's number one military power. They want to displace America. They want to become the world's uh, greatest economic power. Uh, they released this virus knowing full well that it could be uh, uh, spread human to human. Those who tried to say so were killed. They disappeared. And in the meantime, they've wrecked the whole world economy. They, the United States was just really roaring and it wrecked it. Uh, all our medications come from China, it seems like. You can't buy very much in stores anymore. I'd rather buy something made in India or made in Pakistan or Vietnam or the Philippines or Mexico or anywhere else. But now many businesses are actually owned by China. I believe China has also enslaved, using slaves from the Uyghur group, the Muslims in northwestern China, who have now pretty much been put into concentration camps by, I hear, over a million, some say up to three million of them. I saw a, uh, did you see that video, uh, a leaked drone video from China? Uh, thousands of them lined up on their knees, hoods over their heads, guards everywhere, being sent somewhere by train, I, if I cor correctly remember, to the next big factory, uh, slaves. They're basically slaves. Don't kid yourself. They make our Nike shoes. They make the parts for Apple and many, many other companies that we like to buy for cheap. Uh, as, as cheap as possible, although Nike sure making a ton on their shoes. But that's slave labor, folks. That's slave labor. The Bible does say that in the last days, people will be having, uh, they will be uh, transacting slavery. It's in the book of Revelation. Uh, I think it's in Revelation 18. It talks about men's souls are being sold and so on. Anyway, uh, the loss of our civil rights. Be watching that very quickly, very powerfully. Freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. The very first thing mentioned in the First Amendment, let me read it to you. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of, of religion. We can't establish a state religion. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We won't have a state religion, but you should be able to freely exercise your religion. So we supply uh, carpets for the Muslims to kneel down to and pray if they're in jail or someplace or in airports. But we forbid, California forbade uh, uh, the uh, people even congregating in small groups in people's homes. No, you can't. You can't sing. You can't chant. You can't get together. But if you want to protest, you want to burn down some businesses by the thousands of you, go ahead. You have our blessing, basically to protest, to get together, but you can't go to the beaches. 
I mean, we're re and, and you can't exercise your religion. It says right there, no law shall be passed, no law prohibiting the free exercise thereof of religion or the abridging of the freedom of speech or of the press. So if someone wants to erase those big yellow Black Lives Matter wording, that should be freedom of speech. It's freedom of speech to put it down there in the first place. I think black lives do matter as well as all lives. I do. It's the movement that I've spoken against. The movement's done nothing to protect the, the hundreds and hundreds, the thousands, 7,000 black lives killed last, last year in 2019. 7,000, more than 95% of them by fellow blacks. No one ever says that. People are afraid to say that. Well, I just said it. So uh, bridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peaceably to assemble Not throwing rocks and frozen water bottles and nails and, and uh, shooting slingshot shots at the police or each other or whatever. Peaceably to assemble. Not burning down police stations or federal government buildings like they're doing and trying to anyway in Portland, Oregon. So, I mean, that's the First Amendment. We have it up there on the screen, I think. And they're trying now to control our very thinking, our very thinking. So that now you, uh, you have to think like everyone else or you're not woke and they will penalize you on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, all of these places. Uh, if you don't say the right things, you know, you're supposed to now be somebody who's really bad. So be careful because we're setting the stage up, believe it or not, for that great beast power that's coming. So what happens in November will be affecting our country for generations to come. I really believe that. So, what are we to do about it? First of all, remember who your true enemy is. I touched on it very slightly last time, but I want to talk more about it. Our, our enemy is not the far left or the far right or anybody we disagree with. That's not our enemy. Our enemy is identified, his name is enemy, his name is adversary or the adversary. Hebrews say hasatan, ha means the. Hasatan, the enemy, the adver adversary. So that's what his name means. So when we say Satan the devil, or hasatan, they say in Hebrew, the devil, that means the adversary who slanders. That's what it means. So because we understand that he's the enemy and people are not, let's be careful on our Facebook postings that we're not getting nasty, that we're not calling people names, that we are still remembering that we are children of God, that our speech is seasoned with salt. There have been times I've said a couple nasty things too, and I apologize if you see those or ever have seen those. We shouldn't be. We should not be. Now, it's true, when Satan guides and leads certain people so directly, they do become uh, agents of his. They become the enemy. In Acts 13, verse 10, Acts 13, verse 10, Paul talking to Elimus, the sorcerer, notice how he identifies who his true powers and thoughts were coming from. Acts 13, 10, 13, 10 you son of the devil, you son of the slanderer, is what he's saying. You enemy, your adversary of all, you enemy of all righteousness. You see, so uh, yeah, ultimately uh, the beast and the false prophet, they're actually possessed by Satan and demons. Uh, you can read about that later on. But uh, go back to Ephesians 6 verses 11 and 12. We've read this many sermons recently. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look, he says, our fight's not against flesh and blood. Someone might be suing you, and you think, that's my enemy. Think that's going to be a future brother or sister of mine in, in God's family. When he receives God's Holy Spirit, when God calls him and he repents, we'll be reconciled and reunited. Your real enemy is not that person. Your real enemy is, 
is against spiritual host of wickedness. The last line in bold and underlined. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those are the ones we really are fighting. So our real enemy is not those, or are not those, is not those who are so apparently destroying our country, burning businesses, even killing people, looting, killing innocent lives, even toddlers and children. Our main enemy is the adversary. I think it will keep us cleaner in our thinking, less uh, angry, It'll keep us more calm, and help us write more sensible things on Facebook. Uh, we can still be honest, we can still be frank in what we say in Facebook and other places, but uh, in Twitter, whatever, but keep remembering you're the son of God, you're the child of God, you're the daughter of God. Our war is very, very real. We have unseen enemies, but they're very, very real. So we need to put on the, what is it, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God also, and the shield of faith, and the preparation of the gospel of peace uh, for, upon our feet. I may have missed one or two, but I think those are the main, main ones. So number one, remember who the enemy really is. The enemy is not the person suing you, attacking you, burning your house down, your business down. Boy, you might sure feel like they're my enemy. The real enemy is the one whose spirit is empowering those people. Because that's not certainly from God. It's just not. My second point, what we should be doing is seek God as you never have before. Get your personal life in order. I'm really trying hard with mine. To pray more, to get my goals set to uh, define what areas I need to overcome more than ever before. And then diligently seek him. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6 says. So focus on loving God intently and then loving fellow mankind intently, the two great commandments. Why do we focus on that? Because, hey, folks, we're coming to the very roughest of times we've ever seen in our lives. You want to know that God knows you really knows you. Of course, God knows who you are, but does he know you? And do you know him? If you don't know him, he won't know you either. You have to know him. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It's not enough to just talk about the Lord Jesus or Lord this and Lord that. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven is the one who's obedient to God, loving God, walking God's way. Many will say to me in that day of judgment, okay, what you're talking about here, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, taught, you know, preached in your name? Have we not cast out demons even in your name? Then all these wonderful wonders in your name. And he will declare to them, Matthew 7, 23, big bold on the screen there, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never even knew you. And then when, he, when we come to Matthew 25 and the ten virgins that they're getting ready for the wedding, five foolish and five wise, the five foolish didn't carry enough oil with them or extra oil, and they had to go get some more. By the time they got back, the wedding had begun. The door was shut. They knocked on the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. Matthew 25, verse 11 and 12. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. I don't want to hear those words. I want him to hear words. I want to hear words of affection, of knowing me, and uh, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear words like that. Paul's greatest goal, he said in Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11, I have sermons on it, that I may know him. Just write those words down in the search bar. That I may know him, or just even know him, and I'm sure the sermon will pop up. It should be our greatest goal, too, to seek him. Seek him first. Seek him in the middle of the day, first thing of the day, last thing of the day, throughout the day. Uh, cut out where you need to cut out so you have more time to do this. I, I found uh, I, I've had to cut out uh, much more of my, I, I, I watch a lot of the news in the evening and I, I just don't have the time to watch as much as I used to be. I, 
I was spending a lot of time on Facebook. Facebook! And uh, I enjoy seeing what some of you are doing and your pictures and things like that. Uh, not so much the ones about the half-consumed plate of food, you know. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of the other, other things you, you post on there, I, I like that. But it was taking too much time, and I've talked about that before. Satan will rob us of our time. So, notice to whom God calls to prayer. Believe it or not, it's not the whole nation. Notice who must repent. Notice what God says, what God does, and whom he remembers. Notice who he's talking to. In Second Chronicles 7, verses 13 to 16. It's usually 7, verse 14 that's read out, but let's start in verse 13. God speaking. God speaking to Solomon. He had just dedicated the temple, the temple of God in, in Jerusalem. And now God was speaking to Solomon. And he says, I think this was in a dream or vision, I think it was a dream. When I shut up heaven and there's no rain, when I do it, God says, when I command the locusts to devour the land or send plagues among the people, pestilences. I think it's interesting that our President Trump refers to the Wuhan virus as the plague. That's just what pestilence means. I'll send pestilence, I'll send plague among my people. God sends it. He says, God says that. If that happens, in verse 14, if my people who are called by my name, if my people, my family, my children, my people, those who worship me, God is saying, if they will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn, if my people turn from their wicked way. Don't worry about the country so much. Be more concerned about your wicked ways that have to stop and my wicked ways that have to stop. And I have to humble myself and I have to pray and I have to turn from my wicked ways and so do you, according to God. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. What place? The temple. Who's the temple in the new covenant? We are the temple in the new covenant. So pray that God will open your eyes to see wide open what he wants you to see about yourself where we have to change like David even prayed, like Daniel prayed. Daniel 9, uh, Daniel prayed for uh, forgiveness of his people, but he, he always said, we have done this. Go back and read Daniel 9 sometime. We have been, have been failing to, uh, to do all the things that we, we should be doing. But anyway, um, uh, in Luke 21, another reason for getting this close to God is that because of these horrible times that are coming, I do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture because in Matthew 24 it says, after the tribulation of those days, then the world will see Christ in the clouds, the angels who will gather his elect and bring them to Christ after the tribulation of those days, Matthew 25, 24, I mean. Go back and read it towards the end of the chapter. After the tribulation of those days. So anyway, um, it would be nice, though, to know that we don't have to be overly concerned if God would simply protect his people whom he knows. He has to know us. So Luke 21, verse 34 to 36, Take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares or worries of this life. And that day, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ's return, and the year leading up to it, come upon you unexpectedly. It will come like a trap, like a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. You know what a snare is. You know, the, you have it there, and, and the animal that's, that's the target of, of being snared has no idea and then bang, all of a sudden it's, it's in that trap. Watch therefore, pray always. You need to be praying always. You need to watch therefore, because if you're praying always, that you may be counted worthy. Because if you're praying always, we will look, God, Father will look down on, on us and um, 
and say, I want that one protected. You will be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass that he's just been talking about and to stand before the Son of Man. He's just been talking about the great tribulation, the greatest time of trouble the world's ever seen and the heavens and the earth being shaken and uh, all kinds of things that will be happening. So get close to God. Use this time to take a day off or half a day off to just think, plot down areas you know you've got to change it and you've got to repent of and overcome. Spend more time in the Bible. Spend more time in praying and less time on Facebook, less time watching TV, less time on the news, less time on other things. The next thing I want to say is speak up. Don't be afraid to do something, to stand up, to speak up, to be a voice of reason at this time. This point is worthy of an entire sermon, and I will develop it further, but here's an introduction to it at least. Our country is at a tipping point in its history. If things don't change, we are about to lose forever our civil, civil liberties, civil liberties, our freedoms, our cultural heritage, even our history as we know it. School books, someone sent a picture of a big trash bin, you know, the big kind for industrial, full of books from our middle school of traditional history as we've been taught, all in the, all in the trash can. Our country is at a tipping point in its history if things don't change, we're going to lose all of that. God's people wonder what they can do. Uh, first of all, start praying for the nation and for yourself. Like I just said, if my people would turn from their wicked ways to start with yourself like Daniel did, and then get that out to the whole country and pray for God to be merciful, to open the eyes of more and more people in the country. I gave a sermon in March of 2020 on should we pray for our nation and the world, and I hope you'll watch it. Daniel certainly didn't assume, I want you to think about this, God uses people, folks. God can do anything he wants, but he likes to use people. Daniel didn't assume that because the 70 years of captivity were just about done, that all he had to do is start clapping his hands and rejoice because now the time's going to be coming that we can go back to Jerusalem or something. No, Daniel prayed about it in Daniel 9. He didn't take it for granted. And he said, we're, we're still not worthy of you doing any, anything for us because we're still wicked, all of us. So many of God's people are saying today, but God has his plan, his will. He'll do what God will do. Nobody can go against it. I'm certainly not going to go against it, people will say. And I certainly don't want to do anything against his will. And one more point, God doesn't need me, they'll say. And uh, I, I, I certainly I don't want to be the cause of any ruckus or argument. So I'll just lay low and go along to get along and say nothing and let God take care of it all because God has his plan all worked out, being worked out anyway. Well, what Bible are you reading? When God called Gideon, could, could God not have destroyed the invading armies? Did God need Gideon, really? 300 people? Did he really? He, he culled it down to 300, so it was obviously his doing. But could he, have culled it, could he not have culled it down to nobody? And just won the victories himself without using people? God uses people. God used Abraham to deliver Lot, to go on the attack against kings and armies. Look at another example in Esther's day and, and think about how this might relate to you. Back in the days of the Persian Empire, there was a quiet little Jewish girl named Hadassah and it was renamed Esther. She was found to be the most beautiful girl in all the land. And so she was added to the emperor's har harem. Uh, emperor had, was trying to replace Vashti, his wife, with somebody else. So imagine that. You're just a quiet Jewish girl and now you're part of the king's harem. And if you're not familiar with the story of Esther, I, I hope you'll read it. Anyway, um, she had a cousin named Mordecai, and there was a top official in the country named Haman who hated Jews, particularly hated Mordecai, because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him and all those things. 
So Haman plotted or devised a plot to ethnically cleanse all of Persia, all of the Persian Empire, of all Jews, wiped them all out in a single day. And he told people, and the king, he got the king to go along. The king probably just was rubber stamping things with his seal, didn't really fully realize what he was doing. And so basically on a certain day, every Jew in the country was supposed to die. And anybody could kill them. And then whoever killed them got to keep whatever the Jews owned. Does that sound familiar? A little bit like Nazi Germany? Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, told her she couldn't remain quiet. Nobody knew that Esther was a Jew except his cousin. Mordecai's beside himself because Esther was stalling at first. Speaking up could be death sentence to her. You, you didn't just go in front of the king unless he summoned you. And if you did, unless he extended his scepter to you, you would die. You would be executed right there, summarily executed. What would you and I have done? The king didn't know. Didn't know that Esther was a Jew. He didn't know that his favorite uh, woman, the most beautiful woman in the country, was a, a Jew. Be honest. What would you have done? Would you have said, well, God has all this in control. God knows what he wants to do. God's not going to let all the Jews be wiped out because there'd be no Jesus Christ born if that were to happen. That, by the way, was the original intention of Satan. Or, uh, Haman just wanted all the Jews wiped out. He didn't know why, except that he hated them. Satan's plot was to wipe them all out so there could be no Messiah. Imagine that. So anyway, um, God could have had just Haman die. Um, the king hasn't called for me, she could say, and I, I'm supposed to obey the law of the land, be submissive to my own husband. So no, I can't go see him because that would be breaking his rules. That's what she could have said. That's what many of you would have said. Some of you won't speak up with what's going on in the country because you're afraid you're going to get, I don't know, embarrassed or corrected or maybe even fired. So you're afraid to say anything on Facebook. You're afraid to stand up in a, in a group of people and say this is wrong. Burning buildings, graffitiing everything, tearing down statues is not the way to do it. You can tear down statues if we do it the right way, the legal way, way through the, through the courts. Now let's pick, up in, uh, let's pick up the story now in Esther chapter 3. So all these letters were sent out about killing all the Jews. To destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews. Esther 3.13 both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th of the 12th month, the 12th of the Hebrew month, that is, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. See, that's really what they're after. Anyway, so then we continue reading Esther 4, verse 10. Esther spoke to the eunuch, Hetak. said, go to Mordecai, my cousin. Tell him, hey, don't forget. Everybody knows I can't just go in front of the king. Like I've just said, so read that up there while, we're, while I'm, uh, we'll post it up there while I'm talking about it. And yet uh, the king hasn't called for me in 30 days. I can't just go in front of him. There's one law, you're put to death. Unless he holds out the golden scepter to you, that he may live. So Mordecai basically tells Esther something very, very powerful. Verse 13. Mordecai 4, verse, Mordecai, Esther 4, verse 13. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Don't think in your heart that you are going to escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I just love that passage. Mordecai basically tells Esther, Hey cousin, you're about to miss the very reason for your existence. You're about to miss the very purpose of your life. God uses people, and you were put here to protect the Jewish people and the Messiah to come down the road. Over and over, did God need Gideon? No. But God used Gideon. Couldn't he have saved Israel by himself? Did God need David to face Goliath? Couldn't he have just given Goliath a heart attack? So you see what I'm saying? So he's saying, 
Mordecai is saying to Esther, now is your day to do something. Now is your day to speak up. All of us Jews are good as dead, he's saying, if something doesn't change. And you're it. You're it, cousin. Now let that sink in. Remember the real enemy is that, is, 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 was not Haman. The real enemy was Satan. He was trying to kill out all the Jews and let there not be a Messiah. So I think now is our time. Now is our turn to... We were put on the earth at this time, at this time, like Mordecai says, if you remain completely silent, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. Okay, and uh, who, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So please do, please do stand up for the right. Speak up, because I'll tell you there are millions and millions and millions of Americans, Canadians and others, who don't like what they're seeing out in the street, but are afraid to say so. It takes just the power of one, one person having faith to stand up and say something. Some things have gone viral that were just the work of one person, both for good and for bad. Don't think one is not enough to do anything. Don't think so small. Your one, combined with God behind you, is an incredible power. And too many of you are sitting back doing and saying nothing, nothing. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, the palace area, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. So before you stand up, you pray about it, you fast, you seek God's intervention, you seek God's mind, you seek God's will. And so he says, so she says, I will go to the king, which is against the law. Sometimes we have to do the right thing if it means obeying God contrary to man's law. We obey God rather than man in those situations. That's what Peter said, by the way, in I think it's Acts 5, verse 32 or something like that. So I will go to the king, which is, if it's not verse 30, it's there in Acts. Uh, I'll go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So she began to see her purpose. How many of you have seen your purpose. How many of you can say with Esther and Gideon and Abraham and Daniel and you and me, I believe God put me on this earth for this purpose at this time and I will not be silenced. If you can't speak up now, let me ask you this. Why on earth do you think you'll be able to speak up when your life literally is on the line at the time of the beast power coming? When they say, put this number on your hand, on your right hand, or on your forehead, and you suddenly remember, uh-oh, I can't do that. Will you speak up then? Why not have a trial run and start learning how to do it? Now is the time to speak up against those who've hijacked what was a protest and turned it into a socialistic unrest. Now is the time to say it's not peaceful assembly when you're doing criminal activity and killing and shooting and burning and, and uh, committing arson, stealing, looting. Come on, you guys. In fact, that describes Satan, doesn't it? Yeshua said that the, th the thief, the thief, he didn't say a thief, said the thief, Satan's the one he's talking about here, comes to steal, looting, to kill, these shots, that are, Chicago's a mess. New York's a mess. And to destroy. There's your description of what you watch on the news in Portland, Oregon, Minneapolis, New York City, Kansas City, Seattle, all over. So use this time to use the voice. We have a voice. God's given us a time in this country where we can talk to people Use your time to write to your senator, write to your, or fax your congressman. Tell him you disapprove of the huge debt we're going into. Tell him you disapprove of late-term abortion especially, but all abortion, really. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Tell them your views on school opening up or not. Now is the time to say something about abortion and the 60 million that are being killed. have been killed. Turn now to Ezekiel 9. 
God tells us that his wrath, when, his, when, he, when he starts to unleash his wrath, that he will protect a certain group of people. We already read in Luke 21, it's those who are praying a lot. It's those who are, who are watching themselves and who are praying a lot and watching their condition that God will very likely protect from the things that are coming. And then Ezekiel 9, this is a prophecy of God ordering the death of the area around the temple. And we'll post it up there now, verse 3. He called the man clothed with linen, and he said to him, verse 4, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the man who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. When was the last time in prayer that you sighed and cried over what you see happening to your beautiful country? If you aren't sighing and crying, you won't have the mark of protection put on you. Put a mark on the foreheads of the people who sigh and cry over all the abominations. Now verse 5, to the others he said in my hearing, go after the city and kill. Do not slay, do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay the old and young men, maidens and little children and women. Do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. Do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. Begin with my sanctuary. Begin with the ministers. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Are you sighing and crying so God hears and sees? Does it count? You bet it counts. Revelation 9 is another place. In Revelation 9, Satan is allowed, or, or an angel is allowed, to open the abyss. He's given the keys to the abyss, the abyss, the bottomless pit. Apparently, even now, there are some especially bad demons who are so bad that God just puts them in confinement now, awaiting their judgment in the future times, as it says in Jude and I think 2 Peter. But anyway, they hate the abyss. The demons hate the abyss. So remember when demons were cast out of a man called Legion. He had all kinds of demons in him. And, and, and these demons in Luke 8, verse 30 and 31, pleaded with Jesus, pleaded with Yeshua not to send them to the abyss. So, I mean, that's interesting to me. Anyway, in Revelation 9, you read the first few verses, an angel's given the key to this abyss and he's allowed to open it and let these horrific, horrible demons out. They've been in there for thousands of years. But now, when they're let out, Revelation 9, verse 4, these are not good beings. These are horrible demons. They're worse than the typical demons. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. God still has ultimate command. But only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Do you want to get close to God? Do you want to be overcoming? Do you want to be seeking him as never before? You want to be praying as my people come before me, humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked way? Do you want to be spared what's coming ahead? I just read you a verse. Don't harm the men on whom are the seal of God on their foreheads. I want to say one more thing about this. We are going to be judged by the things we've been given. We've been given the ability to have as many thousands of Bibles as we want online if we want to go buy them or whatever. We have been given the ability to live in a country where we can say what we want, where we can worship as we want. We don't have people so far anyway dragging us away and torturing us like they did, like Paul himself did to some Christians. We don't have that going on. Paul was given the freedom to appeal to Caesar and he used it. Paul was given the freedom to not be flogged by, the, by Romans unless he'd been tried and, and uh, examined first, had a hearing. Paul used that right. Acts 22, I'm a Roman. Are you going to beat a Roman? You know you can lose your citizenship by doing that. And so we have been given so many things. I mean, when Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, they weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to speak up. They weren't allowed to go against anything. They weren't allowed to... Uh, so many things we take for granted that we're given today. We will be judged by what we're given. 
Paul used the civil rights he was given. Paul used them. This year, the stakes are so high, and even our own safety is on the line. One side wants to kill babies at any time up to the point of birth. The other side doesn't. One side wishes to have less police, abolish police, defund police, tear down the wall of the president's building on the southern border. One side wants more law and order, on the other hand. The left wants free, taxpayer-funded funded education, medication, housing, feeding, and much more for illegals the minute they arrive. Paid for by the rest of us. If that goes through, the whole world will want to come here. We're already 24 more trillion in debt. COVID Wuhan virus won't be the last pestilence, by the way. If we think we can buy our way out of it. The Bible speaks of many pestilences coming. Many, many. And what's coming will be far worse. And it'll be like tidal wave, one after the other after the other. You want that protection. And this is our trial run. I said it already today. You'll die under God's wrath if you take the mark of the beast. You'll die under their wrath if you don't. I'd rather die under their wrath, but be under God's good graces. Speak up. Do you know that in 2016, 25 million conservative evangelicals did not vote either way? Now, I'll talk about voting some other time. I want to give the pros and the cons of it. You decide. You have to do it according to your conscience. I see nothing in the Bible that says don't vote or to vote. But there are some very, very real principles. But when the stakes are so contrasted by not getting involved, by not speaking up, if you don't want to vote, then don't vote, but at least speak up. Say something about abortion. Write to your senator. Write to your Congress people. Use the rights God's given you. You're going to be judged by the rights you've been given. You're going to be judged by that. So this is our trial run to learn how to speak up and to speak out, to stand up. And I'm noticing that more and more conservative blacks, conservative whites, conservative Hispanics are speaking out, including celebrities. I posted them on my Facebook, in fact. They're really not the only ones. And when people realize that, wow, even uh, Morgan Freeman is saying, no, there's no racism that's systemically built in. Where are, you get, where are you getting that from? I mean, he and so many others, Candace Owens and, and Judge Thomas and so many others who are Hispanic and black, uh, who work hard, use the systems and the freedoms we have in this country and do well. He even told uh, Don Lemon, he said, look at you, you're successful, I'm successful. Where's the racism that stopped us? That's what Morgan Freeman said. So anyway, when the world starts to see that the whole world is not yet in monolithic single way of thinking, because you're standing up, you're saying things, you're speaking up, maybe, just maybe, more of them will stand up as, as well. If you can't stand up now, will you be able to stand up when your life depends on it when they ask you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in that uh, Yeshua or Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Do you believe he was perfect? And if you him and hog, Jesus said, Yeshua said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, Mark 8.38, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. On Sabbath, Saturday, September 26, is a, if they allow it with all the COVID thing, but pray for this, there's a planned very large gathering of God-believing people. I know they don't keep Sabbath, all of them. Some of them do, but not all of them. They all don't keep the holy days. They probably eat pork and stuff like that. But people who know God as best as they can, try to obey him as best as they can, will meet in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall. And I'm going to talk about this in just a minute in terms of Nineveh, because it applies to us too. And they have a pledge to return and to repent 
to God. It is not a political meeting. It is not a Republican versus Democrat meeting. It is not about anything except we as a group of people want to come before God and apply 2 Chronicles 7.14 and repent of our sin. Turn. We want to turn to God. We want to humble ourselves. We want to ask for his mercy on ourselves and on the country. The website is thereturn.org. The actual meeting is September 26, Saturday, Sabbath, 2020, September 26. Please check it out. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think it's a wonderful thing. Will those people all believe the same thing we do? No. Will they all be Sabbath keepers? Some are, many aren't. But let me ask you this. When Nineveh repented, did they all start keeping the Sabbath? Did they all stop eating wrong foods? Did they all start destroying all their idols? Did they all stop lusting after other women and men? Did they all stop everything? They stopped enough of their sin, enough of their violence, to spare them for many, many years. They fasted. They cried out to God, and God saw them turn enough. Enough was done that God hearkened, and God changed his stated intention. The return, September 26, 2020, is actually planned to be part of a 10-day searching of ourselves for forgiveness that starts, believe it or not, on the Feast of Trumpets, September 19, 2020. Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, is the day it will start, and it will end on the Day of Atonement, September 28, 2020. Imagine that. Imagine that. God tells us in Malachi 3, 7 that if you return to me, I will return to you. Let's go back and think about Jonah now and the, book, and the story of Nineveh. If you turn with me to the book of uh, Jonah, which is where we find the story of Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3. The people of Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God, proclaimed the fast. There wasn't the king, not initially, not initially. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. It started as a grassroots movement, is what I'm saying. Ordinary people started crying out to God as best as they knew how. Verse 6, then, then word came to the king of Nineveh. And he arose, and then he, you, you go back and you can read in verse 7 and 8 and 9 that he says everyone is going to humble themselves. Everyone is going to stop eating and drinking for a time. And we're going to be covered in sackcloth, but everyone must turn from his evil way. It's in bold, highlighted, underlined here. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way were they perfectly righteous by then? No, but enough that God relented from the disaster that he had said. He'd already said, just like the whole book of Revelation, something God's already said. I think if enough of us people in our country, it only took 10 for the whole city of Sodom to be spared when Abraham prayed for Sodom, by asking if there be ten righteous, would you spare the whole city? God said yes. God saw their works, verse 10, that they turned from their evil way. God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Likely, yeah, we're going to see everything in Revelation happen. But I think if enough people would wake up, you and I might see a Nineveh applied to the whole United States and Britain, Canada, and so on. If we all would just have enough of us wake up. So I'm going to fast and pray September 26, 2020. Will you join me? It's called the Day of Repentance. Then I'm going to fast again a couple days later on Monday, September 28th, starting Sunday at sundown for the Day of Atonement. Will you join me and thousands of others with us and ask God to forgive us our sins and help us turn from our wicked ways? Special prayers from trumpets to atonement. Ten special days of fervently seeking our God. So as I speak about discerning the times, it must start with this premise, that God's people have to be concerned. 
God's people have to be a praying people. Whether you vote or not, that's your choice. That's your conscience. But God will judge us based on the opportunities he's given us. And we've been given so many opportunities in this land. And the contrasts are so stark this year. I don't want to in any way help more babies be killed. I don't want in any way to let more injustices happen. God's people must be seeking him as never before, sighing and crying like the Ezekiel, being like Esther, standing up, taking the risk. For we were born for such a time as this. I want to say one more thing. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Or 1 Peter chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Honor all people. Love, honor all people. No matter what they're doing to you, we keep our cool. I'm one who speaks out. Honor all people. Let God be their judge. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. When he said honor the king, the king back then was Nero, about as bad a guy as you could find. Peter's telling Christians, honor him. So let's pray for our leaders. Let's pray for our government. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for ourselves that we will wake up and understand there's a reason why I'm alive and why you are alive today. We need to start speaking up, standing up. God's children aren't doing it. We need to start praying for the president, prime minister if you're in other countries, whether they're liberal or conservative, pray for them. No name calling, that's not of God. So let me wrap it up by concluding and reminding you what we said here today. Remember who our real enemy is. And remember that I think we're at a tipping point that if not enough of God's people will pray and turn from their wicked ways, if not enough of God's people will be like Esther and stand up, be like Daniel and pray forgiveness on himself and his country, the very foundations of our country are going down. Satan's going to be just rolled right in. This evil spirit that's flowing already will just get to become a tidal wave. Remember who the real enemy is. Look past the horrors of what people are doing to you and the country to the real evil behind them, and that is Satan himself, who may well have already been cast down from heaven. Then I said, seek God as you never have before. Change your schedule. Change your bedtime, get up time, what you watch, what you spend time on. Start praying more than ever before. We're coming to some pretty rough times. Pray always that you may be deemed worthy to escape the things that are coming. Sigh and cry, like Ezekiel 9 says, so that a seal is put, a mark is put on your forehead, a seal, like I read in Revelation 9, 4. Revelation 7, for that matter, 144,000 are sealed. Do your God-given civil liberties. Use them. Use your God-given civil liberties to speak up at least for law and order, for appreciation. Write to your congressman. That's an opportunity you have. That's what Paul did. He appealed to the Supreme Court of his day, which was Caesar himself. Use them for wanting equity and fairness to all people, for all blacks, all minorities, and whites, everybody, but in a lawful, non-destructive way. Be like Esther. We never know exactly what God will do if enough people, if enough of his people jump in and pray. Abraham asked mercy for Sodom. Daniel prayed for the people. Moses and Aaron prayed for the people God said to Moses and Aaron in number 16, the last half of it, get away from these people, I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses told Aaron to go run in the middle of the camp and uh, with a censer. No, don't run away from them. Run into it, Moses said. God was so impressed that they were willing to risk their own lives and praying for the people who were trying to stone Moses and Aaron. Number 16. Go back and read it. The last half especially. Be sure to hear my sermon on praying for the nation in March of 2020. But yes, speak up. Pray for our leaders and elders. I'll leave it with that. There's so much on the line. This is such a tipping point year. We need you to pray. 
We need you to speak up. We need you to be like Esther and stand up. We need you to seek God. We need you to grow close to God and Yeshua as never before. Till next time, this is Philip. Let's just ask God's blessing. Our Father in heaven, Holy Father, our Father, in heavenly Jerusalem above, we come before your throne of grace confidently, courageously, bravely. Have mercy on us, Father, your children. Help us see our evil ways that we have. Turn from them. Turn to you. Help us seek you with all of our heart and mind and soul. And then have, have, have mercy and kindness to the whole nation. We pray for the whole nation that you will turn their hearts too towards you. Turn our hearts to our children. Turn our hearts to our fathers and mothers. As you say in Malachi 4, and we pray that the mind of Yeshua will fill our minds. Yeshua, be our life. Come into each of us. Be our life. Pour down from heaven your Holy Spirit. And we lift each other up to you now for blessings, protection, and your Holy Spirit. Smile upon your people. Thank you, Father in heaven. Thank you for all you've done already. Thank you, Yeshua, for all you've done. Father, send Christ back to rule this earth soon, please. No more delay. No more delay. But do watch over us, protect us, all of who are your people. Put a seal on their forehead and a mark on their forehead. Watch over them. The dangerous times we live in. In Yeshua's mighty name, we thank you so much. We thank you for even what we're going through because you're in all of this. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.